Thank you, Eric. And uh, <coughs> I guess I'm going to kick off uh, something which uh, quite unifies what uh, Emmanuel and what uh, Ilya will be, uh, will be talking about as well. But what I want to do is actually to start with something very basic to just have everybody on the same page about what will be uh, talked about both myself and both uh, Ilya and, uh, and Emmanuel at the much more advanced level. So for today's lecture, I'm just going to actually start with setting up the very basic static Merlisian problem. Uh, I'll describe the simplest that I know, dynamic Merlisian problem. And I'm going to show you uh, quite a general result, but if you understand the simple examples, you'll understand uh, the model, I think, more general. So what I want to start with is you want to start with a, with a static, uh, static, static problem, a static model, where there are two types of people. The probability or pi a measure of people who have, say, skill theta a, and uh, pi uh, d people who have skill theta d. Okay. So we'll have utility of consumption and of uh, labor or leisure. And labor is uh, the output y is going to be produced by theta, your skill, and L times your effort. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be at various points of time. I'm going to be assuming whether theta A is observable or theta or theta D is observable or unobservable. So let's first start with the simplest, the simplest setup. So suppose I want to. Yes. Okay, so I want to set up the problem. First, actually, I want to look at the, the first best unconstrained yeah, option. So this is your leisure. It's easier for you. Suppose you want to produce, you know, five apples. Your skill is a billion. You'll need to, uh, you'll need to provide, you know, less effort. Okay, so I want to just start with a simple problem. You know, suppose I want to look at the first best. And uh, what's going to be the first best? What the first best is going to look like? It's going to have some social welfare function. I suppose just utilitarian. You can put some other weights on it. So u of c a plus v of y a over theta a plus pi d u of c d plus v of y d over theta d. So this is the social welfare function. I have pi a measure of able guys. I cannot simultaneously talk when other people talk. So. Uh, there is measure pi a of people of a type and measure pi d of people of d type. I just measure them utilitarian at, at, you know, at weight one. Let's write down the feasibility constraint. So again, write down the simplest feasibility constraint. So less or equal than pi a y a plus pi d. Yd. So anybody knows the solution to this problem? Oh, gentleman in the back. No. Anybody? Well, wait, we're not going to write down anything. So suppose uh, so. This is the solution. The first best where theta a and theta d are observable. Okay. So what we're going to do is you know, if we solve, we can just find the first row conditions. We're going to equalize the margins, u prime C A, u prime of C D. We're going to uh, equalize equalize the consumption labor margin. U prime of C A is going to be equal to the prime of Y A over th uh, theta A, and vice versa. Okay, so this is the the first best problem. So it's you know, something very basic, something very easy to uh, to analyze. Okay, so one can think about this problem as just a redistribution problem. Or a term you can think about this as an insurance problem. So think about these people as being less lucky, and we want to redistribute to them from people who are more lucky. Uh, so those guys who are more lucky who have higher skill theta A will just work more. And uh, the able and disabled people in the simple setup will get more able and you know, less able. I'm going to use D here. Are going to get the same, uh, the same consumption, but they're going to work a different amount. And the margins are not going to be distorted. Okay, so what happens if uh, the skill is unobservable? 
Okay, so scale is unobservable, but y and all the c's are observable. And in fact, neither skill nor your effort is as observable. So if you're if either of those is observable, I can just back out the the needed. So how do we modify this problem? Anybody? And sense compatibility. How will that look like? Yeah, suppose you get the only thing you can lie is you can lie down. So the able people do not want to pretend to be uh, disabled. So here on the right hand side, we'll write u of ca plus v of y a over theta a. And what does it mean to pretend to be a disabled guy? Or less able. So theta d for now, suppose, more than zero. So it's going to be, a, I'm going to pretend to be disabled person. So I'm going to get consumption cd. I'm going to get, um, I'm going to get uh, allocation yd from the planner. The planner requires you to, to work the allocate amount yd. But your true skill is theta a. Okay. All right, so we can solve this problem as well. So what will this problem imply? So we'll just do it. So let's assign multiplier, multiplier new here. And let's first uh, say find uh, the first order condition with respect to uh, to CA. So we'll have pi A u prime of CA plus mu u prime of CA equal to uh, lambda pi A. Okay. So let's find the first recognition with respect to, to YA. So we get pi A u prime, or I'm sorry, pi, pi a v prime of y a over theta a, 1 over theta a, plus uh, mu a, I guess mu, v prime of y a over theta a, and it's going to be equal to lambda by A. Okay? So what does this imply? So if we look at this equation, if we take out U prime of C A and V prime of Y A here. Okay? So we did this with our condition, we'll see that there is uh, no distortion on, on the top guys. And we can do exactly the same thing. And that we'll see that there is a, a distortion for the person who has, who has a low skill. Okay? So this is, a, this is a static problem. So now, in the interest of time, I want to do something actually relatively quick. And I want to do the dynamic version of this. And then I'm going to show you how to do it a little bit more general. So now suppose we have sort of the same or very similar setup. But in the setup, there are going to be two periods now, t equal to 1 and t equal to 2. In period 1, everybody is going to be identical. So I have a skill theta 1 equal to 1. And in period 2, you can be either a theta a or you can be just disabled. So literally, you have theta d equal to 0. Okay, so I want to write down uh, an analog of uh, the problem, but dynamic, dynamic problem. So and you don't know whether you're going to be a theta a or theta d. You know some probability pi a or pi d that you're going to be uh, either able or you're going to be disabled. Okay? So let's write down. So in the first period, you're going to be u of c1 plus v of y1 over 1. The skill is 1. Plus. You have pi a, the probability of you becoming able. Actually, no, let me, let me make theta a also to 1 for simplicity. And with pi, you're going to be, uh, you can't work, so you're just going to get assigned 
consumption of the disabled person. Yeah, so let me write down the feasibility constraint. I'm just going to assume that, you know, like as you have seen here, you don't discount the future. And uh, uh, the interest rate across periods is going to be 1. Or well, the modular rate transformation is going to be 1. So I'm going to have C1 plus pi A C A plus pi D C D less or equal than Y1 plus pi A Y A plus pi D Y D. Okay, so this is going to be the first best. Right, so here, if everything is observable, then there is no incentive compatibility constraint. And uh, I can just solve this problem. So one of the features of this problem is that the, the Euler equation is going to be satisfied. Okay, so we'll have u prime of c1 is equal to pi a u prime of ca plus pi d u prime of cd. Uh, sorry, it's, one, it's zero. I'm going to erase this. All right, so uh, how do you modify this problem to, uh, for, this, for the circumstances, for the environment where uh, the skill is unobserved? Okay, so let's think about this for a second. Now, if you work anything, if you provide positive amount of output Y, certainly you are an able guy, right? Because disabled guy cannot produce any, any output. Well, where is the informational friction? Informational friction is if you work zero, whether you're truly disabled or you're not truly disabled. So again, you can think about the situation as either a distribution, or you can think about this as insurance, lifetime insurance against the possible, the possible shock. So let's write down the incentive compatibility constraint. Okay. And um, you know, I, I'll write down in a simple form, and you can think for a second about where the simple form comes from. So u of ca plus v of y more equal than u of cd. Okay, so why, why is it the same as the static incentive compatibility constraint? Well, it's the same because just think about your possible uh, deviation is everybody is the same in the first period. Then in the second period, you plan the following thing. If I am able, then I'm going to pretend to be disabled. So it doesn't matter whether I write it in this X post format or whether I write it in the X ante, in the X ante format. Okay? So now uh, let's, uh, so this is, the, this is the setup of the problem. And this, in fact, is going to be what we'll see over and over and over in much, much more general uh, setups than this. Um, okay, so everybody clear on this? I guess it depends here as well. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, sh I'll show you for, so now I just want to illustrate this. And I'm going to show you that for anything and everything under certain conditions, something that you'll see here is also going to be, also going to be true. Okay, so now let's um, amuse ourselves for a second. Let's uh, find, uh, again, the first order. And uh, the first order conditions I want to take are the first order conditions with respect to C's. Okay. So let's find with, with respect to C1. I'm going to have u prime of C1. Just take lambda. We have uh, pi A u prime A uh, plus mu u prime of C A is equal to, uh, to pi A. And now let's do it with respect to CD. We're going to have pi D U prime of CD plus mu or minus mu, sorry. U prime of CD equal to pi D. Okay, let's for a second uh, look at the first best problem. If we didn't have this constraint or this constraint didn't bind, for example. So if mu is equal to zero, then this will disappear and we'll get our Euler equation uh, missing lambdas here. We'll get our earlier equation right away. Okay, now what happens here? So let's 
the following thing. So let me uh, divide both, uh, both sides of all the three equations by the marginals. Okay, so I get one equal to lambda over u prime of c1. I get pi a plus mu uh, equal to pi a lambda u prime of ca. I get pi d minus mu equal to pi d lambda over u prime of cd. Okay, I'll just sum these two things. So I get one equal to pi a lambda, actually I'll divide by, by lambda. One over lambda pi a over u prime of ca plus pi d over u prime of cd. Okay, what's one over lambda? Well, we know it from here. It's one over u prime of c1. So what we get is we get something that looks like, like an Euler equation. Is this Euler equation the same as this Euler equation? How many people think it's the same? Raise your hand. How many people think it's not the same? Huh? Oh, sorry. I guess I can see. If you could see how many people would think it's the same. Okay, so how many people are too tired to raise their hand? That's every, everybody in the back. Okay, so why is it different? Because it's one all, right? So this is the inverse Euler equation. So if you ever wondered where inverse Euler equation comes from, it comes from the simple exercise like this, and it's actually much more general. All right, so keep this in mind. And uh, um, I guess we can do one more thing here. Um, maybe I could do this later. What would this imply about something that looks like this? If C1, CA, and CD solve this problem, what would this imply for uh, whether this equation holds and which way would it hold? I kind of remember Janssen's inequality. One. Anybody else? Two. Three. Um, yeah, weighted, not weighted. I don't know. Okay, so what if we apply um, Janssen's inequality function one over x. Yeah, so if they're the same number, then we actually get exactly the Euler equation. If it's not the same number, what happens? So we have u prime of c1, and I'm going to put the question mark here. By a u prime of ca, plus pi d u prime of cd. Does it, how many people think it's, it's like this? How many people think it's like this? How many people think it's like this? Okay, so which way is it? Uh, everybody has to participate. Okay, let's do it again. How many people think it's like this? Okay, how many people think it's like this? Uh, I know, I guess the rest think it's equal. So it's like this, right? So you distort the Euler equation such that, so think about, you know, just decentralized problem, or think about Ramsey problem. So it means that uh, there is an additional cost of transferring resources in the future. So there's a wedge, the intertemporal wedge, that uh, you know, wants to lower the, I guess, the savings, in, for the lack of better words, here. Okay, so uh, that ba that's basically everything you uh, need. Ah, uh -huh. not, not quite at the first best. There's going to be no distortion between 
the margin u prime of ca and uh, v prime of ya but it doesn't mean that ca is no, at the no. first best but c cd will be below v uh, that's right so so so, so absolutely v prime of cd will be yeah bigger. yeah so uh one thing we know for sure is if we have this condition holding, so if mu, if mu is non-zero, so if this condition binds, that CA should be bigger than CD. So if there is an incentive problem, we know that CA is not equal to CD. CA is not equal to CD, then we can just apply Jensen's inequality to the function of one over X, and we can flip once. Right, so the bottom line is the following. So every time you have an incentive problem in the dynamic setting, you would get A, you would get inverse Euler equation instead of the or in, instead of the Euler equation, and you will get an intertemporal wedge or savings wedge if uh, C A is not equal to, to C D. Okay, so what's dynamic about this model? Is it dynamic because we repeat the problem twice or we have two periods? Not quite. Suppose we literally repeated our simple example that I described to you in the beginning twice. Okay. Well, the problem will, will not be a wedge like this. They, they, will, they may change behavior. Suppose you have deterministically changing <coughs> types. You know, their types are, you know, say 1, 0 in the first period and 25, 3 in the second period, but deterministically. But the first period everyone's identical, identical and everyone works. The second period, some of those people by definition do not work, and some people choose whether to work or not. But, that's yeah. still but suppose I just repeat the problem twice. The, same, the very first little example I described to you, I just repeat it twice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it looks dynamic, there are many periods, but uh, is, this, is that repetition somehow different from what I have described here? Sure, but in the, in the repeat example, it's going to be the same thing, right? They'll have to decide whether they work in the second period. It's going to be a sort of the same constraint. Yeah, yeah, but let's forget about, you know, the, the properties of the optimality. I just, want to, I just want to think for a second about the structure of the problem. So the fundamental, the fundamental difference is that, so when we're gonna be talking about new dynamic public finance. So what's dynamic in new dynamic public finance? It's not that it's just repeated n times. Is that there is stochastic uncertainty about your tomorrow, tomorrow status. Uh, no, 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 but you wouldn't get the inverse Euler. I mean, I guess you would get the inverse Euler, but there's going to be no intertemporal wedge. No, you would get the same solution. The, the radians, now they're stay the same during the first period, but now they're going to stay the same. If the agents know theta 2 in the first period, true. So but if they don't know the theta 2 in the second period, in the, if sitting in period 1, they don't know theta 2 in period 2, so the, the solution is going to be different. That that is in period 1, they don't know it, and in period That's right. Absolutely. So if, no, no, no. So if you're, uh, I'll, I'll, call, I'll call it dynamic model without stochastic types. But in the model that you described, so if I understand correctly, is the following. So you know, I sit in the first period and I know the whole sequence of my shocks. It's a dynamic model. There are many periods, but it's not going to be dynamic in a sense that I want, want it to be dynamic is that uh, I want to have stochasticity about the types. You'll get exactly the same inverse Euler equation. However, there's going to be no wedge. It's going to be. I don't think so. No. Okay, tell me why not. <laughs> so, so what do you mean? It's just it's going to be it's going to be different. I think. Yeah, 
but here you but here you're not gonna have you know so so it's gonna be But in the so but but the your model is you know you sit in the first period you know your type, and in the second period uh, you are going to be type C one. Um, oh, it's going to be the IC is going to be different. But okay, but hold on. So, but let's look at the let's wait, wait, wait. Let's look at the other equation here. Your other equation is going to be u prime of c a is going to be equal to pi. As actually, you know, you know exactly what your type is going to be. Uh, c one. Yeah, so in, in this, so I think in that setup, you'll have CA Yes, okay. Well, how about I'll just move on? We'll just write down this problem, and I'll I'll, I'll guarantee you it's not going to be. A, so it's but it's going to be a guarantee. It's going to be a, it's going to be different. Okay. Can we just turn on the thing? Okay, so basically what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do uh, use a actually much more general setup to talk about you know similar issues, but always keep in the back of your mind this little example. I think it's going to be much uh, much easier for you, and this is based on my work with uh, Mike Golosov and with uh, Narayana Kachalakara. Okay. All right, so um, I'm just give a little bit of a background on uh, public dynamic public finance. And uh, uh, there are two strands of literature you, you may, might have heard of. And one is, is more uh, macro, or the, know, for lack of better words, yeah, I guess macro strands of literature were that I guess macroeconomists have been primarily interested in. And uh, it, it's a dynamic Ramsey problem. So it's a setup where there is capital accumulation and where the primary goal of the government is to fund a stream of government purchases. Uh, the way how this problem is restricted is that a priori only the linear uh, taxes both on capital and on labor are allowed. Okay, so if you think about the main results of this literature, there are many interesting results there, but one of the key results is the result called the chumley judd result, which basically says that it's optimal for capital taxes to be equal to zero in the long run. In fact, uh, under certain conditions, it, uh, it's optimal to have capital taxes to be equal to zero you know, after, after a period uh, beyond, beyond the, initial, the initial period. All right, so there is also the Merlissian optimal taxation, you know, the, the stuff for which uh, Jim Merlis got the Nobel Prize. And uh, those models are primarily the static models, but you know, a couple of uh, small exceptions. And uh, those models have no capital accumulations, no capital accumulation. They have, at the, at the source of these models is heterogeneity of the skill levels of the agents. And uh, there is an informational friction such that the skill of the agent is not observed, but the, uh, the income, income and consumption are observed. So the goal there is slightly different from the classic Ramsey problems. It's to transfer resources from agents who are more skilled to agents who are, uh, who are less skilled. Okay, so alternatively, we can think about this not just the model of redistribution, 
you can think about this model as insurance. Ex ante, before you decide what society to be born in, you decide on the insurance scheme, which either will you know, give you a lot of consumption when you're disabled, a little bit less consumption when you're disabled. So it, you can either think about this as a redistribution, or you can think about this as the, uh, as the optimal ins or insurance, insurance scheme. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the question, this is the question of what, what I want to be talking today is whether you want to have uh, the, something that looks, that looks like a chamlet jad result in a situation of dynamic mirrorless model. Whether you want or you, whether you don't want to tax uh, consumption or temporal or whether, or more, more specifically, more precisely, is whether you want or not to distort intertemporal margin. Okay, so I'm going to look at an economy which has both capital and effective labor. It has a continuum of agents with unobservable skills, and skills are going to stochastically evolve over, over time. Implicitly, I do not restrict myself to any particular tax scheme. I don't say that, you know, the taxes have to be linear or taxes have to be of, you know, one particular shape or form. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to solve for the optimal allocation and then, and there's a separate industry which I'm going to be talking about a little bit or touching a little bit upon, uh, is how to move the model, how to, how to implement the model, how to move from the solution of the social planners problem to the solution of the, um, in, in the cent decentralized market, what taxes will implement this. But for now I'm going to be just talking about, just about the wedges. Okay, all right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually look at a skill process that can be any stochastic process. And uh, this generality is, is I think important and nice because even though we have some idea about how skills evolve stochastically over time, we still don't know uh, exactly what it is. Well, you know, there are many, many questions and uh, um, how, big are this, how big are the shocks, how big are the uh, fixed effects. And uh, the result I'm going to derive to is going to be independent of these assumptions. Okay? So the key result I'm going to derive is the optimality of intertemporal wedge, essentially the equivalent of uh, this thing here. Okay? So specifically, if you look at an economy where there is dynamic informational friction, you would get that it's pretty optimal to distort the allocations, which would look as if, so if you think, you know, say in the Ramsey setup, or if you think more generally, as if there is an intertemporal wedge. The marginal utility of consumption today is less than expected marginal utility of uh, consumption tomorrow. And typically it's gonna be optimal for this inequality to be strict. So if you compare it to the classic chamlet jad literature, then it's, you know, it's very different because there the zero capital tax would imply that there is no wedge in accumulation of the capital in the long run. So in the long run, and actually quite often in the short run, you will have the intertemporal Euler equation uh, holding, and uh, uh, this will be you know, direct contrast with uh, the equation above. Okay. All right, so uh, I, I want to say it uh, right from the beginning is that uh, when I mistakenly going to say the word tax, it's actually not going to be a tax per se. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be wedge. So, and uh, it's not simple, actually quite difficult to move from the wedges to the taxes that implement them. Is this you know, strange or not strange? Well, think about, for example, you know, Ramsey taxation exercise. Think about uh, the capital tax. Well, you can have, the, you can have the, the same intertemporal wedge be implemented with a capital tax, okay? Alternatively, you don't have to have a capital tax. You can just have a differential tax on consumption, consumption tomorrow. If consumption tomorrow is taxed higher than consumption today, this will exactly be equivalent to the linear uh, capital tax. So even in Ramsey-like models, there is a lot of indeterminacy about these taxes. Here, since I don't assume any particular tax scheme, this indeterminacy is gonna be, is gonna be multiplied um, 
you know, in, in, uh, in a much, to, to a much larger, to a much larger extent. So I'm going to leave the implementation whatsoever out of this, out of this talk. I'm going to be talking about implementation maybe at the very end of this uh, sequence of, sequence of lectures. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be large, right? There has to be a wedge. The marginal, yeah. Right. Than so the expected. Yeah. So if you want So more specifically, if I if I move a unit of consumption from today to tomorrow. Then the marginal utility of consumption, the, the you know that uh, the at the optimum, this perturbation would yield me this. So it doesn't necessarily mean that consumption should be you know increasing necessarily. I mean, in fact, it's going to be uh, yeah depends depends on many many things. Yeah. Okay, so let me let me look at the setup. So I'm going to have uh, t periods. And t can be infinite or t can be finite. I'm going to have a unit measure of agents. I'm going to have one perishable good. I'm going to have identical utility for uh, all of the agents. So agents is going to care about consumption and going to care about this utility of labor. They're going to weigh the consumption across time with the discount factor beta. So in fact, for all of the discussion here, I'm going to assume, so come back to your question, I'm going to assume that consumption Utility of consumption and utility of labor is separable. And it's going to be actually important for uh, the way how I construct, construct the proof. Okay, you know, some basic assumptions on, on use, on C's, on L's. You, you were talking before about the generality of the model with respect to, uh, to, to the stochastic shock. To the form of preferences, so at this level of generality, at this level of generality for the stochastic shocks, I cannot have, I don't have the result uh, on the intertemporal wedge. You know, there, I'm going to be talking a little bit about you know, a slightly more general result uh, tomorrow. But, you know, at this level of generality for any arbitrary uh, skill process, and that's exactly, that's the only thing I think I can, I can derive. Um, I think it's, we, we have seen that, that you, know, you see this wedge in you know, many, many more general circumstances. For example, for consumption and labor, for utility between consumption and labor being non-separable, but I just can't give you the result at that level of generality for that level of generality of the, of the skill process. Okay, so let's, let's talk about exactly about the skills. So just think about the skills as drawn each period from um, from the uh, from some set theta, and uh, uh, what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be doing you know, a little bit more notation cumbersome, but uh, but it doesn't have to be. So let me just try to intuitively explain it to you. So think about just a sequence of lifetime skills that one can have, okay? and there is some some probability measure of the skills. So for each agent, they're going to be a draw of this, this whole uh, sequence of skills, but you would learn the sequence of skills only at time t, but not before. So very similar to what. So you know, you know, you know the probability distribution about what your skill are going to be tomorrow. So you know, you know the history of certain, you know, the history of your skills up to now, but not in the future. So the skill is going to be unobservable. Okay, so only the agent knows it, but nobody else, uh, nobody else does. Okay, so that can be anything: stationary, non-stationary, fixed effects, etc. Okay, so what, is, what do the skills do economically? I already talked a little bit about this in the very beginning. 
Suppose theta t is your skill. Lt is how much you work. And you produce yt, which is the combination of theta t and uh, lt. yt is observable, but neither theta nor l are observable. As I said before, if you know either of them, you can just back out the, the, you know, the third element. The amount of labor, the amount of uh, the amount of labor one can put in will be limited at some point. Or so above a certain, above a certain production, therefore above a certain production, y will be theta will be observable. Yes, I, I guess I assume boundedness here on uh, maybe I even don't. I don't even know whether I have the skill. No, certain skills can be unbounded. But the skills are unbounded. But the labor, but no, the labor, but the amount of labor should be, I assume, should be, should be bounded. I mean, well sure. bounded for period. Sure, you have it bounded. So it means that beyond, there, that beyond a certain level of skill, why will, skill will be observable. Because there will be a certain amount of skill that, will, that you will not be able to... If I have the bounded... If you have, bound, if you have bounded labor, bounded, bounded quantity of labor, then above a certain yt, your skill, your, your skill will be revealed. If, I produce, if my skill is infinitely high, and I only have one year to work, and if I produce... But what if uh, you know, but there is somebody else whose skill is even higher? And you know he'll pretend to be the same skill. I mean, I don't have to be necessarily just only representing hours. It could also be like think about this effort. Think, think yeah, think about this effort. You know, like LT can be. You know, you can think about this as hours, but hours probably are observable. You can think about effort. You know, I mean, all of us are putting the same number of hours sitting here. You know, some people are checking Facebook. Some people are you know doing a variety of other things. So some people use the facts, some people don't. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have um, a single capital good with uh, initial endowment uh, K1 star. And uh, then again, so just to set the general notation, I'm going to be uh, thinking about allocations. So I'm going to be thinking about allocations of CT and YT. Think about the planner assigning a sequence of consumption and effective labor that maps from the history of your skills into, into that, that allocation. Okay, so again, CT and YT are measurable with respect to the history of the skills, so they cannot depend on uh, the future skills. And K is just an aggregate, aggregate K. So since consumption here is observable, it doesn't really matter who, uh, who saves. I can have the government or the social planner to be saving everything, uh, or I can have, I can require each individual agent to solve, to save a piece of the, uh, you know, a piece of the capital that aggregates to, uh, to total capital. Okay, what's uh, what's a feasible allocation? Well, there is some production function f, and the aggregate consumption plus the capital saved for tomorrow is going to be equal to the leftover capital delta is depreciation plus aggregate. Uh, production today. So Y is just aggregate amount of labor uh, produced, or aggregate amount of output uh, produced. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to look at incentive compatibility. So let me first look at the, the reporting strategy. So again, the reporting strategy is theta t measurable. It's measurable with respect to the history of your skills, but you can think about this as now you draw a possible plan for all possible uh, types you can be. So think of this little example, you know, if I am to be an able person, I can pretend to be a disabled person in the future. And I'm going to call uh, Big Sigma the set of all reporting strategies. Okay? I can assign the utility from a strategy Sigma, and uh, this is going to be discounted utility from following this, uh, yeah, from, from following a given reporting strategy. Sigma, not as a, this is your true skill. So exactly the same, the same way as we have described in this, uh, this little example. So what does it mean for a strategy to be truth-telling strategy? Well, it's, uh, um, what, what does it mean for a strategy to be incentive compatible? It means that telling the truth gives you higher 
uh, utility than pretending to be you know, somebody else or following any other uh, reporting strategy. Okay, just a small aside, you know, we can think about this X anti incentive compatibility constraint, or we can think about X post incentive compatibility constraint. We can think about, you know, the possible plan which I can do for each possible realization of my shot, what I'm gonna do there, or I can think about you know, if time comes, uh, what will I do? Uh, what will I do there? Okay, why is that? You know, if X post does not apply X anti, then I can always find a deviation that would improve my utility. I guess so. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, okay, so let me look at the planner problem. So the planner, what does the planner do? So the planner uh, maximizes the X anti utility of the agent. So the planner here is utilitarian, subject to everything being incentive compatible and feasible. I don't have to be utilitarian here. I can put some weights here, for example, like on different agents. I can be Rolson if I want. I can do uh, I can do many many other things. Okay. So the main theorem is going to be the following. Let me start with uh, the allocation C, C star, Y star, and K star, um, which solves the planner problem. Then for any history theta T, which can be, which is reached with positive pro probability, I get the, uh, the following inverse Euler equation. So expectation of U prime over U prime of CT plus one of the next period, given the history of the shocks theta t is going to be equal to the marginal rate of transformation. So if you, if you want, you can move 1 over u prime here, and you'll have expectation of 1 over u prime here. Okay. Uh, so let's compare this theorem. So this intertemporal, the inverse Euler equation. The inverse Euler is 1 over and 1 over here, if you want with the usual first order condition for capital accumulation. So we know that if there is, if not of the CT plus ones are equal, we can just move expectation. We cannot just move expectation down. So these two things are potentially quite different. Okay, All right, so let me just sketch out the proof for you. And there can be different ways how to derive it. And I'm just gonna give you give you one way. The easiest way, if you, if you want just to use it and to understand the, the inverse order equation, the wedge, the intertemporal wedge, it's actually a simple example that uh, I have shown to you. Well, let me first start with what does it mean for an allocation to be an optimal allocation. Well, an, an optimal allocation is a location that is incentive compatible and feasible, and it should use no more resources than any other allocation that gives the same objective to the planner. So in other words, suppose I find, suppose I look at the optimal allocation, and I find another allocation, which is incentive compatible and feasible, uh, delivers the same objective to the planner, but uses less resources. So I mean, there are various ways to derive uh, how, to, how to describe use less resources, but suppose it does. Suppose it has uh, you know, less initial capital than the same problem described here. Well, then it's actually easy to show that I can find a way how to redistribute this extra resources across different people to make some people better off and potentially even everybody uh, better off. Okay, so uh, the optimal allocation should be uh, perturbation proof against any uh, perturbation, which, which is of the following sort. Okay, 
what we're going to do is essentially I'm going to construct such perturbation. We're going to take an optimum. I'm going to call it C star, Y star, K star. And I'm going to look at the consumption allocation C prime. That is going to satisfy the following restriction. If I take any sequence, possible sequence of uh, skill shocks, the allocation C prime is going to deliver exactly the same utility sequence by sequence as the original allocation C star. Okay, I can do that. I know this is star. And I can, I can construct this allocation C prime uh, that gives exactly the same utility sequence by sequence. Well, let's check what this allocation C prime implies. Well, obviously, it gives the same uh, utility to the planner, gives the same value to the planner. Well, it delivers sequence by sequence the same utility. It must deliver the same uh, value to the planner. Okay. Is it incentive compatible? Well, it is. So it's very easy to show. And, uh, but intuitively, that's basically what I do here, but intuitively, it's certainly incentive compatible. It delivers, you know, each sequence by sequence, it delivers exactly the same, uh, the same ordering as the incentive compatible allocation. Uh, that, that the original incentive compatible, the, the original optimal and incentive, optimal allocation, which is in turn incentive compatible. So you can do it uh, in uh, a little bit more formal way here. Okay, what does it mean? Well, for the optimal allocation to be optimal, it should use no more initial capital or initial resources, if you want, than any feasible allocation of that sort. Because that feasible allocation delivers the same value to the planner, it's incentive compatible, and it is feasible. So that's, that's exactly going back to, to Ilya's question a little bit. So this is going to be a necessary condition on the optimum. And that actually what allows me to uh, solve it at, at that level of generality. So think about actually optimal allocation. So optimal allocation is, uh, cannot be improved by any possible perturbation, by any possible reallocation of C, K, Y. Well, potentially it's different or difficult to look at all the possible perturbations. So what I'm going to be, what I'm doing is I'm just looking at a very particular perturbation to derive a particular property of the optimal allocation. In fact, it's it's just just that inverse order equation. Uh, so yeah, so the way, you know, so the, 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 the constructing this perturbation, I'm restricting myself to, you know, so think about the, just the first order condition. So the first order condition is, you know, you go in any direction you go, you should not be able to improve upon the optimal, upon the optimal location. You know, again, uh, under the constraints. But what I'm doing, so, and, you know, it's, in fact, find the first order condition like I have done in that, in the simplest, in the simple example, would allow me to characterize the whole problem characterize the scene and, and more, more importantly, why. So that's the whole first order condition. But uh, I'm interested in, for this particular exercise, only in one property is the intertemporal, how the intertemporal consumption uh, evolves. And for that, I can just construct, if, if, you know, if I'm clever, I can construct a particular perturbation that allows me to illustrate that property. So it basically it says that the original allocation, the original optimal allocation must solve the following uh, problems. Must solve the minimize, so the initial level of capital, minimize this level of capital, minimize the amount of resources we have, such that all of the sequences are feasible, and such that state by state, or the skill history by skill history, it delivers the same allocation. So if you take the first order condition of this problem, you'll exactly get the inverse, uh, the inverse order equation, which is this. 
just as a, as a small aside, you can do it the way I have described here. You can literally consider a perturbation. I'm going to illustrate this, uh, this perturbation uh, in a second a little bit. Oh, absolutely. And we get the same. You get exactly the same lower equation, except, actually, I'm going to come back to this in a second, and I'll show it to you. Except for all the CT plus ones are going to be the same. And it's literally going to be the, the Euler equation. In fact, the inverse Euler equation is a generalization of the normal Euler equation for, incentive, for the problems with dynamic incentive compatibility. I'm sorry, all the, okay, sorry. These are going to be the same. Your prime of, I think it's on the same slide, in fact. <coughs> Which is this. So in the first bet, so the model you're studying has this inverse. In the first bet, all of the. In the first bet, C tip, all the CT plus ones, regardless of your skill, yeah. are the same. So all people consume the same. All people consume the same. Is that a fixed or something? Uh, I mean, uh, it's, I don't know, it's, uh, I guess it's realistic. I mean, if consumption and labor is non-separable, that would not be the case. Uh, for example, the more you work, the, war, the more the planner wants to allocate to you. Again, so it comes back to, I think, Eric's question is, uh, I'm giving you a lot of generality on the skill shocks. Uh, to, uh, so for any skill shock, I'm going to show you under separable consumption and labor. I'm going to show you something that looks like so the, uh, the property of the optimal location is the inverse Euler equation. Uh, there are many, many other cases for which a version of the inverse Euler equation holds. Okay, but uh, I cannot. Uh, I can, what I cannot derive to you is the following: Give me any utility. Give me any stochastic process. So that I cannot tell you whether inverse Euler uh, inverse Euler holds. Okay, so I'm actually coming back to exactly your question. If all the shocks were public, then the inverse Euler equation would still characterize the optimal allocation. However, all of this are going to be the same. And in fact, you will have no distortion, even though inverse Euler will hold. There will be no distortion between U prime and expectation of U prime, which is the same number. Okay. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So it doesn't tell you how much, how much it, uh, how much distortion it gives you. And, but uh, I mean, certainly, you know, what Emmanuel is going to be talking about, what I'm going to be talking about. You know, it's, it's. Uh, I guess it's still a little bit of a work in progress uh, about how exact, what exactly it's going to give you. But, but this is the general problem. It's a Nasser condition for any uh, model with uh, which has the, uh, which has. CT is a bit different. Okay. okay. All right. Inverse Euler equation holds for public shocks, but what happens if uh, we have uh, uh, we have an incentive constraint? So what happens if the variance of this C is is positive? So what if some of the CT plus ones are not equal to, to the other CT plus ones? Well, just applying Jensen's inequality, we'll see immediately that if this is strictly positive, then U prime is strictly less than expectation over the U prime. Notice that there is nothing here about precautionary savings. Okay? It's literally about the property of the function one over X. Look at this. So, but it's not it has nothing to do with uh, precautionary precautionary savings. Okay, so the bottom line is the following. So, take any skills, any skill process. If there is uncertainty about tomorrow's type, if the CT plus ones are different tomorrow compared to today, or different uh, for uh, among each other, that uh, we will necessarily have the intertemporal wedge. And in fact, it's going to be uh, strictly positive. 
Okay, so let me give you a little bit more of intuition for a wedge by doing slightly uh, different uh, perturbation that for me is quite useful uh, to think about uh, how this whole model works. Uh, and it comes back also to, you know, what does this intertemporal wedge necessarily imply for you know, how one can think about this as, as savings. But there are no savings here because full optimal problem where there are allocations of consumptions. But, you know, it's going to give you a little bit of intuition along that, along that line. Okay? All right. Suppose we start optimal allocation in some history of theta t. Suppose a lower consumption in that allocation by epsilon and I increase consumption for all possible theta t plus ones, for all possible histories tomorrow, for all possible realization of history tomorrow by the same amount rt plus one epsilon. Okay, so such perturbation should lead to no improvement in social welfare. If the optimal allocation, any perturbation I can design should lead to no, uh, to no improvements. Okay, so let, let, let's think through the effects of such perturbation. Well, I move a little bit of consumption to the future. I lower my social welfare today by u prime times epsilon. Well, I give everybody more in the future. I increase social welfare by uh, the marginal utility of consumption times this amount of stuff you know, times beta r. Well, but there is a, a third effect here. By moving a little bit of consumption in the future and giving it in the equal amount to everybody, I reduce the covariance of consumption with the skill. So there's an incentive effect that lowers the, uh, the desire for me to you know, reveal my type or to work the proper amount. And this leads to the reduction in incentives, and this leads to a third effect on uh, the social welfare. The social optimum, the gain that the stuff I give tomorrow should be equal to losses, the stuff I reduce today, plus this incentive effect. And this would imply that this is just given more to everybody in the future, given this today there should be a wedge between these two numbers. What about the you said the measure But uh, does the planner know this prime information or not? I mean, it's like it's, but the, pl the planner knows the distribution of every type. So, so actually, you know, if, if, if you hold on this question, so uh, Emmanuel, I think, in tomorrow's lecture, in the lecture about tomorrow, will give you, I think, much, much more detailed intuition about, about how, the, how this works you know, in, both, in both of these papers. So I guess that, yeah, the result, of course, is true. So the intuition may have to change again. So this is, this is a more for, I guess, for the, for the illustration. Oh, yeah, yeah, Do I have it here? Maybe I don't. Okay, so let me actually talk about, uh, uh, about, about first the, the intuition of the inverse order equation. So the best intuition of the inverse order equation I have is the following. Uh, so one of the things you want to do in, in a variety of the public finance settings is you want to smooth, smooth distortions across time. So think about, for example, uniform commodity taxation uh, result. So I don't want to distort the way how, uh, so given some distortions, actually, actually that's the biggest thing I have learned from Ramsey models. I want to equalize distortions. So here the distortion, uh, 
comes from having incentive, incentive problem. So it turns out that uh, the strength of this incentive problem is related to the inverse, to the u minus 1 of, uh, of providing you a unit of consumption. Okay. So and then smoothing this distortion would mean that I equalize the derivatives of the inverse of the function u across different people. So and that, that would give what well, gives me the one of u prime. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'm not sure there is not much physics to it because I think the assumption that makes it work is that your productivity that you pay is the same and it also is a partial equation for the physics for it to be like that. That must be assumed somewhere. That you have a stochastic process that's only on the same state. But imagine a situation where actually the way it was example in the beginning with the reverse timing, your productivity today So we can talk about this. So this, this result, you know, as I stated, is is true for any stochastic process. Yeah, but this is a, this is an assumption. Stochastic process is only on productivity. The assumption is, say it again. The assumption is, is only on, productivity. on productivity. True. Which means that which builds in the assumption that your productivity is. If you tell me my productivity up to today, I will, you know, have oh, true. Distribution oh, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if if so, in any model where there is a mix, or I mean, just think about yeah, think about the example in the, in the very beginning. Suppose I also have the the private information about you know, so the the evolution of my scale. So this probably will not be true. I mean, maybe maybe true. Uh, we can talk, again, so you know, we'll, we'll just write, write down on the board and I'll just tell you exactly because I think we may be talking about slightly, slightly different, slightly different things. So here, um, you know, planner knows, you know, planner knows the distribution of the productivities and, uh, uh, you know, and I guess as such it will, it will, it will hold for any, for any stochastic process. Okay. So um, what I want to do is I want to, so in the interest of actually, I was finished a little bit earlier. I want to talk about two, uh, two different things. So, <clears throat> and then I want to talk a little bit more about the, the implementation. Okay, uh, so what we have done here that uh, we looked at a model where agents are heterogeneous in their skills and this skills evolve stochastically over time. We show that it's typically uh, Pareto optimal to have a wedge between a marginal rate substitution and marginal rate transformation uh, across time. Moreover, I can sign the wedge. I can show you that the intertemporal wedge is typically positive. <coughs> and you know, if your reference is the classic results of Ramsey taxation, say the chamley jad result of zero capital taxation, this would be very, very different uh, result and very different implication. So if you have stochastic heterogeneity, typically you want to distort uh, the intertemporal margin for the reasons of uh, providing, providing incentives. Okay, so this result is uh, limit, on one hand it looks quite general, on the other hand it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit limited. So many of the things we have talked about uh, today, like for example, you know, I can only derive it to you for the consumption and uh, labor being, uh, being separable. Um, a bigger issue, and I just wanna to touch on this just a little bit today, is about implementation. So what's so difficult about implementation here? Well, I mean, one, so, so suppose I find the optimal solution. So I find consumption, labor, allocation, I find all the wedges that are there, and I ask, do these wedges correspond to taxes? Well, in a Ramsey model, on one hand, it's, it's usually an easy exercise. So you have the wedges, they directly correspond to taxes. There may be some multiplicity, like what I have referred in the very beginning, when say capital tax can be uh, represented as different consumption taxes uh, across time, but you know there is uh, there is still some. Uh, it's a relatively easy task to go between the optimal problem and the competitive equilibrium. I mean we know one implementation here, 
which is a very easy implementation. It's also probably not quite a satisfactory implementation. One implementation is direct mechanism. So I solve for the optimum, and then you know, different people come to me, and I tell them, you know, if your sequence of skills is this, you have to work exactly, or if your report is this, you have to work exactly this, and you have to consume exactly this. Can I do it as a planner? I mean, obviously I can. I have all the power of nonlinear taxation. So for example, I can restrict your uh, consumption and effective labor pairs or sequences to be only drawn from you know, a particular set. And uh, you can only choose from that set and the solution to the optimal allocation, since it is incentive compatible, will ensure that you do everything truthfully. And in fact, you choose exactly the same allocation as the optimal allocation. Well, is this a particularly interesting implementation? Well, maybe yes, maybe not. So on one hand, probably we don't see this thing in reality where people come to the planner and planner tells them you know, exactly how much to work. Maybe it was true in you know, Stalin, Russia, but even there, you know, there was, uh, it was probably not, not quite. So, so then the question is how to move from this optimal solutions to the competitive equilibrium with taxes. And this turns out to be quite a complicated problem because the moment we move to the competitive equilibrium, we're also given additional ways for the agents to do other things. For example, to do, to do savings. So then the question is how exactly we control the savings. I mean, we can always prohibit savings with nonlinear taxation. But then we're back to this, uh, to this, general, uh, to this general implementation. Well, so the question is, you know, how to implement? And I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, what's a good implementation? There are a variety of impl implementations that have been proposed. I'm gonna, be I'm gonna be talking about one of them uh, in a very specific setup, the setup of the disability insurance, where you have asset testing. So hold off on this. There have been uh, implementations that were, which were proposed by Narayana Kachalakota, which are, um, you know, you keep track of the, you essentially have the direct mechanism on the labor side, but then you feed the wedges for each realization of the tax. Okay, so that's one implementation. Always works, works quick and easy. Uh, there is a very nice implementation by Ivan Vernon who, pro, who uh, gives an implementation where you use uh, a linear tax on capital, which is, the, which is constructed in a very, very clever way, and um, also something that looks similarly to the direct mechanism on labor. So the bottom line is the following, that implementation is a little bit of, a, of an art rather than a science. So the way I like to think about implementation is the following. Um, let's, we always have something to fall back on. We always have direct mechanism. But if one finds an implementation, maybe for a particular problem, maybe not for as general a problem as this, which resembles something we see in reality, you know, whether it's asset testing, whether it's you know, history dependence, such as, such as a social security of a particular form, then uh, it gives me uh, hope that this is the right implementation. Implementation that can potentially use some of the, uh, some of the <coughs> elements that already exist in, uh, the, in the public domain. So that's uh, sort of one head I have. The second head I have is which I actually uh, come closer and closer to over, over the years I work on this, is that I think uh, these problems are fundamentally about wedges. And uh, uh, why they're fundamentally about the wedges? Because again, there are different ways, even in Ramsey setup, how to characterize the same wedge with different, or how to implement the same wedge with different uh, tax instruments. And uh, for me, I guess it's interesting to describe the wedges and then we can think about a particular implementation. But uh, the fundamental uh, feature of the solution, of the optimal solution is still, for me, the wedges rather than the taxes that, uh, that implement them. Okay, so that's basically the introduction to uh, the new dynamic public finance. And then we'll see in a variety of ways how, uh, how, how, you know, how this whole literature developed and uh, um, you know, how Ilias uh, uh, 
uh, work uh, fits in and gives you know a huge boost to how to solve how to solve these problems. You know the the stuff that Emmanuel did will give you a lot more intuition about the properties of the inverse Euler equation, and I will talk about the cross-sectional properties of the the solutions and uh, about a particular implementation in a particular uh, application. Just to finish a little bit earlier. <laughs>